Uh, how you doing? How's that sound? It's pretty good? Okay. Um, looks like all systems are go. Perhaps some more people are going to straggle in in a little bit, but uh, we can get started. Um, so my name is Brett Manning. Uh, you see me on the site as Chart Trader, and I've put together this little webinar. I've got a PowerPoint presentation with a few slides just basically to go through uh, first an argument that has to do with why I think it's okay to start trading other asset classes in different markets. I used to trade just stocks, um, but as you can see on the site, I've moved out, started trading currencies, commodities. I don't really trade fixed income, but we'll see. If the bond market starts to crash, hey, that'll be pretty good. Uh, it won't be good, but you know what I mean. All right, so I'll talk for a little while, give you that argument, and then we'll get into some trading concepts and some charts and some setups. And then afterwards, hopefully, we'll get through that reasonably quickly. And afterwards, we can spend some time with as much question and answer as you guys want to do. OK, um, let's get started. All right, so first, the argument. Uh, this is where I want to say that it's, it's, it's OK, even if you're not really a 20-year you know, veteran pit trader in crude oil, that, that you can actually apply some of the same logic across markets and, and trade basically where the action is. Uh, so, so this argument is really about two things. Is it feasible and is it desirable? Uh, feasibility. I basically break things down like this. Um, relatively simple argument. The two terms that I use down at the bottom basically give you my perspective. You can you can use fundamentals and technicals, but I don't think it really gets to the same point. So I look at it this way: exogenous information and endogenous characteristics. And basically, what I'm talking about: exogenous information. This is pretty much stuff about the world. So anything that can be a headline, that can pop across in play, that can be on CNBC, that's about something other than the market itself. That's exogenous information. What most people, I think, concentrate on most of the time, except for pure technical traders, and I would not necessarily call myself a pure technical trader, but we'll get into that later. So there's the exogenous stuff. And the other side of it, the other possibility, the endogenous factors, how people are positioned, where their cost basis is, what their time horizon is, how leveraged they are, how hedged. This is what technical analysis probably tries to get at, but the thing itself is positioning. It's about how the market is held. It's what I think of as sort of the guts of the market. And this is what I try to focus on and try to figure out however possible, whether it's through technicals, whether it's through sentiment data, whether it's through just tape reading, just sitting there watching order flow, whatever. What I'm trying to figure out is where the weak hands are, where the strong hands are. And we'll get into those concepts in a very precise way later, and I'll show you how they play into the setups that I use. But big point is, this stuff, it's the same for every market. The exogenous stuff, this differs across markets. Individual markets have very specific things that trigger them, that move them, and the, the headlines that most affect them, for instance, crude oil with the inventory data, or, or you know, European e ECB statements out of Triche and the euro, et cetera. But this stuff is all the same for all markets. So if you if you basically specialize in that, you know, my assumption is that you can you can trade any market. But my big assumption here that I want to get to that basically guides the reason why I focus on that and the, the reason why that allows me to trade many markets. Generally speaking, I don't believe that I'm going to have an edge on the market by trying to predict or interpret the exogenous stuff better than the market already does. I don't fully believe that because I don't believe in market efficiency entirely. But basically, the way, what I would argue is is you know, I'd have to be able to predict things better than the majority of capital in the market. Most of that capital is controlled by large institutions. They spend billions of dollars on having the best research, the first data, the smartest people, and the fastest read and react resources possible, and I'd be competing with them. So, so basically what I try to do instead is try to figure out what they're doing rather than try to, to outsmart them in terms of my read of the data or my prediction of what some company's earnings are going to be. I try to actually figure out what they're doing and, and tag along. OK, so that, I think, pretty much takes care of the feasibility argument in my mind. All markets are just crowds of people. They differ in terms of how things in the world affect them, but they're roughly the same in that they're all just a bunch of people. And if you get good at reading a bunch of people, it means you can pretty much trade anything. That's at least what I believe at this point, and it's what guides my decision as far as what I trade and how I trade it and what I see as being sort of the definition of an opportunity. And hopefully you guys see me do this enough, and you've been here long enough to see that, that it can be done. The same person can trade different markets and trade them well. 
Okay. Um, desirability. I'd say this is a, a, a pretty simple point to me, anyways. I think that if you can if you can manage to trade different markets and trade them consistently, then when there's nothing going on in stocks, but there's something crazy happening in currencies, you can take advantage of that rather than sit there pounding away all day at something that's just not happening, trying to force it. Perhaps you feel really good as a trader that day, but you're trying to force it because nothing's happening in the market. But maybe you can find a market where something's really happening. There's a lot of order flow. There's a lot of price inefficiencies and a lot of tails. A lot of people just peeking up positions. A lot of people buying haphazardly, and you can take advantage of the way those patterns are working out if you find that market, that market that's trading that way with a lot of edges. Plus, in my opinion, right now it's getting more and more difficult to trade individual stocks, and I think that it's, it's basically getting more and more difficult to trade anything that's roughly a, a less liquid market or a less big market because it can be pushed around by individuals who are trading various algorithms and high-frequency schemes. They can actually create inefficiencies for you. And, um, and I don't like to mess with something where I have to read somebody, some individual's mind or how a particular program was programmed. I'd rather read a crowd of people. And if one individual can easily push something around, then, then it becomes tougher for me. But it's very difficult to do that sort of thing in something like the euro. You really can't push it around nearly as easily. So I like to be able to expand out in terms of the size. I'd rather trade the entire S&P than trade an individual stock. I'd rather trade a currency market or a commodity market because I feel like I can trust the crowd behavior is going to actually come through and nobody's going to be able to interrupt that price pattern and, and fundamentally change it just on the basis of their whim or decision. So I like large markets and, and trading futures, which is what I like to trade, gives you leverage so that even large markets move plenty for you to make a buck. And uh, so there's yes to the first two. Yes, also, that it's a really good idea, even if you don't trade these markets, to, to understand how commodities and currencies relate to stocks. If you're just going to be trading stocks, individual stocks, then at least understanding, especially in this day and age when everything is basically macro right now, driving driving markets, whether it's a European sovereign debt or, or the, the tax issues or, or, or Chinese inflation or whatever it is, these macro issues are coming storming through and basically dictating the price of even small cap stocks. The market's got a very high correlation ratio right now. So I think it's a good idea to understand that and be, be adept at watching these other markets, understand what it really means to watch a currency market and track it and see that, say, the dollar's ripping and, and how that leads to, to various decisions you should make as far as which stocks you're trading. So even if you're not trading these other markets, I think it's a good idea to learn some of it. Okay, so hopefully that's clear and you agree with my argument. It is both feasible and desirable, at least at this stage, if you're willing to, to, to buy into it for the rest of this. It is both feasible and desirable to learn to trade large markets, other markets, etc., and to focus on what I call trying to detect the endogenous character of the market. Okay, So as far as vehicles for trading different things, we're just going to quickly go through some points about ETFs and futures, and then we'll get on to some concepts and some setups. The vehicles you have, pretty much two choices, ETFs and futures. I prefer futures. Uh, there are a couple problems with, with ETFs, but in some cases, for some markets, ETFs are fine. And so we're going to talk about those real quickly. All right, problems with ETFs. One, is the leverage. In certain markets, there's just not an ETF that gives you anywhere near the leverage that you need to really be able to trade intraday patterns. Currencies are a good example. Um, the second point, the second problem, and we'll get into this afterwards, is anything with a multi-day position in certain types of ETFs are a big problem. But there's two types of ETFs that we'll focus on there. So first, first let's look at the leverage, though. If you're trying to trade the euro, you're trying to trade FXE, and you want to be able to, to take advantage of a pattern, Currencies don't move very much on a percentage basis. A one one hundredth of a percent move in a currency is a decent sized move. And if you're trading FXE, that's going to give you nothing unless you have just a massive position. But if you're using a futures market, you can take advantage of those intraday swings and make money. I put this example up a couple weeks ago in a Euro trade that I did on the site, basically breaking down that trade and showing that we got, in fact, I think we got at just about one one hundredth of a percent, but it was a decent swing in the Euro that day. And uh, the way I argued it is if you put four contracts on, it costs you about $18,000 to put that on in terms of capital. And if you played the position out to the end, you'd have made a little over three grand. That's about an 18% return on that capital. If you were to do that with FXE, just to prove my point, you'd have had to have well over half a million dollars of buying power to get the same type of result. So less than $20,000 versus well over half a million dollars for the same payoff using futures instead of the ETF. 
So there's an example. There are a few markets that have that problem where you really can't get by using ETFs. Most of the currencies, some of the commodities. UNG is another example. You're not really going to be able to trade natural gas trading UNG. I mean, just the commissions alone, if you think about it. If, you're, if you have to buy 15, 20,000 shares just to profit from a 10 cent move, which is actually a decent move, rather than three, two, three contracts of natural gas, I mean, think about the commissions difference. You're talking about just right there, $100 to $5. So if you can use the futures market and use it safely, and we'll talk about that in a minute, then I think it's a good idea to learn to use that tool. But I'm not going to try to promote that too hard because you can also blow yourself up. Okay, multi-day trades with ETFs. Two problems. Two types of ETFs have problems for multi-day trades. The leverage funds and the funds that hold futures contracts. The leverage funds, things like BGU, UPRO, FAS, FAS, etc., they try to give you multiples on the return. And a lot of people don't realize that if, if they want to say short treasuries and they just buy the hell out of TBT right now, they think that it's just going to work if treasuries go down, therefore TBT will go up over time. And that's not exactly the case. And I want to show you this. Uh, let's see. This fictitious example first. If there's an index, XYZ, and somebody wants to make an ETF for it, and it's a leverage ETF. They've got a leverage long, XXX, and a leverage short, YYY. If you watch those two, you can see how this math tracks out. And here's why these things have a problem. Let's say one day XYZ goes up from $10 a share to $11 a share. You can see what XXX would do. It would go to 12. It would do twice as much. And YYY would go to 8 because it's the inverse. But let's say the next day XYZ trades back down to 10. If you do the math, you'll see what the two ETFs do. They have to move twice as much in the respective directions. What you'll end up with is XYZ went from $10 to $10, and both XXX and YYY lost money. And if you, if you play this out over enough iterations, there will be enough sideways chopping movement, which is when they get taken down. Basically, all leverage ETFs will someday be pretty much worthless. I think they basically approach zero as an asymptote. And what you get is these companies that put them out are just going to keep on doing reverse splits. That's what they've done so far, one for 10, one for 5, one for 20, whatever it is. As these things trickle down and gradually get close to worthless, they do the big reverse split. So let me show you FAS and FAZ just to prove the point. They started up in 2008. You can see the black circle here. I think this is FAZ. Opened in this area. It's down here now. FAS opened in this area. It's down here now. Both of them are significantly down. A ton. And one of them is the opposite of the other. The market can't have gone both directions. It did, the financials didn't split in two. So you can just see, here's how it plays out. So if you think long-term positions, watch out for the leverage ETFs. That's the main point I wanted to make there. OK. The futures ETFs also have a problem. That problem is the way the futures work is there are, are different contracts. And forgive me for those of you who know this, I'm just going to take two seconds and explain this. So something like natural gas may have these three contracts trading at these three different prices right now at the same time. Here may be the current one. Say this is the next one. This is the one after that. What UNG will do is it will sell, when it gets close to expiration, it will sell one of those contracts and buy into the next one because it can't hold into expirations. So it's going to do this each month. It's in, in other words, sell low and buy high repeatedly every month when expirations comes along if the market is in a state that's known as contango. Contango basically means future months are trading at higher prices than the current month. So if you've got a futures market that's in contango, the ETF that's holding those future contracts is going to keep being somebody uh, like a terrible trader, just sit there selling low, buying high over and over again every month. And it's going to take those losses. And what you get up with, or what you, what you end up with is, here's what natural gas has done over the last couple of years. This is the continuous contract for natural gas prices. This goes all the way back to early 2009. It's roughly sideways. Here's what UNG has done over the same time, because it keeps on every time there's a contract switch, and this market's been in massive contango this whole time. Every time there's a contract switch, it sells a contract low, buys it back high, takes the difference as a cost. And so it's just been in a dead downtrend, down from like 18 to 5 over the last couple of years while natural gas prices have gone sideways. So if you think you want to play natural gas as a long, long term, you do not want to do it by buying UNG unless that market shifts into a state called backwardation, because then it will actually be a great trader. UNG will end up 
buying low and selling high every month, and it will actually outperform natural gas. So wait for backwardation before you start doing something like that. All right. Um, so there you go. ETFs can be kind of a problem, but you can actually use both of these flaws by shorting the leverage funds. Over time, they're all going to go down. You've got to stay liquid because they can move madly against you in an emotional market. But And I'm not recommending this really as a strategy. It's more of a, a, a sort of thought experiment. You could short the leverage funds and buy the uh, futures holding ETFs when they're in backwardation, and you basically have guaranteed profits in both cases, theoretically, especially if you can say liquid. All right, so there we go, vehicles. Now, I want to put this warning out because I'm kind of promoting futures trading right now. And for those of you who are less experienced, I just want to make the point that if you remember what I said about FXE versus versus the CME Euro futures, and the fact that $18,000 was like over half a million dollars in terms of how powerful it was for the returns, it's also that way for the losses. And if you're trading something that's less liquid, like silver, and you've got a small account, if you've got $20,000 and you put five contracts on in silver, it can hit an air pocket and wipe out all of that capital in about 10 minutes. So you have to understand that when you're doing this, you're, you're, you've got the other side of that. You have to be super disciplined. And if you're not very experienced at this, just especially if you're not very experienced with dealing with yourself as a trader, if you've been doing this four or five years and you've gone through the cycles of, of emotional control and you realize when you're vulnerable to making sort of big gamble bets, it, and you know to not do that when you're having a bad day, then this is okay. If you haven't been through that and actually gone through it and felt it and, and, and had a few disasters and come back from them, then I would not suggest trading futures unless you really just go into it with the idea that you're going to stay very, very small. So hopefully, as it says on the bottom, I'm not burning you. I'm not setting you on fire. I'm hopefully making you a fire. Okay. Um, All right, one other thing I just want to make. One point about order entry, and then we'll go on to the concepts and the setups. One thing that I've learned over the years and that I just want to kind of throw out there, there are two types of orders when you're going through your broker and putting orders up. There's native orders and there are synthetic orders. Native orders are actually on the exchange. There are limits, stop limits. Synthetic orders, things like a stop market, that's, a, that's not on the exchange. That's on your broker browser. That's it. If you become disconnected from the internet and you just have a regular stop in, you won't have a stop in. It won't trigger. It's been my experience. If you have a limit in, a stop limit in, it will trigger even if you get disconnected. So the way that I do it is I use a stop limit. I put the stop price where I want the stop loss order to be. I put the limit price well through the market. So let's say I'm long from 88.50 in crude oil, and I've got a stop at 88.25. I'll put the stop limit with the stop at 88.25 and the limit order at 87.75, and that's a limit sell order, which means it's through the market. It's on the other side. So the second the stop is hit, the limit order will become a market order that will hit the market. That's the way I found to be the simple best way to do it so that you know you're safe. Okay. Um, and from there, let's move on. All right, so now some about me. <clears throat> my background. I got started about 10 years ago, uh, and hopefully you can understand me. I'm kind of under the weather, so you may be able to hear that in my voice. Um, I got started about 10 years ago, and the way that I started was trying to program systems to beat the uh, NQs and ES. And I spent about three or four years while I was living in St. Louis. I was actually bartending, and um, I'd come home and just basically stay up all night just writing lines of code to try to do this and back test. And this was two or three years of this. And, um, and I lost you know, thousands of hours of sleep. But it actually, I think, helped me get better and better at reading the market. Because when you're trying to, to tell a computer how to do something, it's got to go through bar by bar. It's got to examine every data point and make a decision. So you've got to break down the instructions to such tiny, tiny issues that you question a lot of your own assumptions. Um, and, and the way that that kind of worked out for me is I, I, I think I got more of an intuitive feel out of it. I didn't come up with any holy grail system. Uh, even even with some systems that have thousands and thousands of lines of code, I, I just basically think I sort of programmed into myself somewhat of an intuitive feel for price action. But I also got rid of indicators in my life pretty much. So I don't really use any, any oscillators or, or any moving averages. Perhaps you do, and perhaps you're good with them. I've just found that as I was trying to program that that hard right edge concept is really important. and and. You know, it looks like you see something like RSI or MACD that actually signals an entry. You look at it in retrospect, and you see it on the chart when it's halfway across. 
and it looks like, wow, RSI really signaled a great entry here. But if it's actually happening in the flow of the bar building with that hard right edge, that signal was never there in time to get that entry. I mean, that's what you find when you try to program a computer to take it. It's really tough. But if you, if you, if you use things like that and you're, you're really good with them, my suggestion would be what's actually happening is you've developed a real nuanced feel for reading it. It's not the indicator that's doing it. It's your experience with it. And you've gotten a real, real feel for, for managing yourself and your reaction to what it's doing and, and being able to pick up subtleties. And it's tough to program those things into a computer. And I think that I've, I've done the same thing for myself, but just with bars. So I pretty much just watch, watch you know, candlestick charts with volume. I don't really pay that much attention to moving averages. I do pay a lot of attention to support and resistance and trend lines and just basically pattern structure. And I try to detect who's where. <coughs> so um, and with that, I, I'll actually show you one setup first just to kind of introduce kind of how I look at things. This is something I call an in-the-pocket setup. I don't know why I call that. I've just always called it that. Um, this is this is the, the spoos from mid-July. And just, just to give you the framework, this is important to me, the fact that we come into this day. Uh, you can see the, the, the open right in here. Previous day was a trend up. Sentiment is extremely bearish at this point. We've got the, the American Association of Individual Investors survey, something like 70% like bears. We've got a uh, high put call ratio, et cetera. There's a lot of people looking for the market to either crash or break down or something. Econ data is terrible. Companies are warning. You get this big uptrend. Next day opens up, pulls back, puts in a first check of support. And so what I'm thinking while I'm seeing this rally here is, you know, is there a serious buyer, somebody who's, who's lost all their exposure during all the negative sentiment and, and, and basically feels very underexposed now to equities now that we've got the big bounce day. So as the market pulls back, it hits this level again, it pukes through it, and I'm just thinking, you know, this is the big bar check, I call it. Um, this is, if, if, if you get this, you get this bar right here, you get this series of about four bars, that's going to make the long side less risky because that's already going to kick out a lot of the weak hands. And then we find that there is a buyer here. So the, the buy for me for stocks for the S&P is this pullback right here. And I usually set up some scaling orders right here. You see me put this sort of setup all the time on the site under BGU. I'm actually taking it in ES, but I put it up under BGU. And you, you probably recognize that this is the sort of point where you might see chart trader buying BGU at such and such, risking such and such. And that risk is probably going to be right here. So I'm assuming the higher low and buying into it. Here's the result on this day. We go through that trend line and we really start to squeeze. I like to get this entry. This is in the pocket because it means I'm taking very small risk so I can take quite a bit of size. And I like to, I like to know that my risk is small overall and I'm just getting this advantageous point. So that's kind of the way I look at the market a little bit. And now we'll move on to some more concepts. I just want to show you that first. All right. Key concepts. This is really sort of a defining key concept for me. Strong hands and weak hands. You hear me, you see me use these terms quite a bit. And, um, and I want to get like, really precise about what I mean and why I see these ideas in particular as being so important. So here's what I mean. A strong hand, this is somebody who, if they own something, if they're long, you know, this is a very abstract way of looking at it. And of course, on different time frames, the subtleties apply, but just in the abstract sense, what I mean is if, if their position goes against them, they're a buyer of more. A weak hand is just the opposite. If their position goes against them, they're a seller if they're long. If they're short, you know, they cover on a rally rather than short more on a rally. A strong hand shorts more on a rally if they're short. So that's all I mean right there by those two concepts. And there's a couple points about that. I'm always a weak hand. Every trade I put on, I'm a weekend. We're traders. What we are, we can. That's it. That's just the way it is. Unless you're a bad trader, I think. If you're if you're a strong hand and you're trading on an intraday framework, then then you're somebody who's going to get lucky a few times and then lose everything. I think that's basically that the way that works out. So those that sort of game theory dilemma of that point precisely is why all traders are turned into weekends. Over time, they learn that they need to cut their position short when they're not working. So that's what a weekend is. Strong hands, they believe in something else. They're not really worried about the price action or the swings. If the price goes down, it's, e it's even a better value to buy. And one note I put at the bottom, which is interesting, we saw this in 2008. Even the, even the insurance companies and the pension funds were starting to dump stocks. I mean, if, if, if a market goes far enough against 
a strong hand, eventually they become a weak hand. And what capitulation in the market is, is when strong hands have turned into weak hands, you have to shift the market into new strong hands. That's why bottoms form the way they do. They get that big heavy volume, that big running bar. Why would they sell on that bar? Well, the reason why that bar is that bar is because it's the strong hands who become weak hands passing the market off to strong hands, new strong hands with a better cost basis. When the market gets set into those new hands with that great value and they're willing to buy even more if it goes down further, that puts a bottom in the market. So we saw that obviously a, a couple times in late 2008 and again early in 2009. And a couple times this past summer we saw something I think relatively similar. Okay. Um, now just to kind of Bear with me for a second and let's kind of go into these concepts just a little bit further. If you just imagine the, the sort of theoretical market here, you can see what the long interest is. The S's there represent strong hands. So you've got a market with, say, let's just say six strong hands and two weak hands. That's what the long side is made of. What the short side is made of is one strong hand and like five or six weak hands. So the shorts are weak hands. The longs are strong hands. Now you can imagine this market having any pattern, but let's just say it's a sideways consolidation. You could have the same looking sideways consolidation be the opposite kind of market, and that's important. It's not just about the pattern. It's about that how time frames converge and put people in these positions. So uh, you'd see in this situation, if that sideways consolidation happened to be this version where the short interest is mostly weak-handed, and the long interest is mostly strong-handed, then what you get is pretty simple. That market is essentially an untriggered positive feedback loop of buying and higher prices on any nudge higher, right? Because all those shorts are, are just sitting there waiting to cover. If price happens to go up, there's just going to be a feedback loop. And it's also an untriggered negative feedback loop in the other direction. It's self-reverting. If it's nudged down, it will get nudged right back up. And if you, if you imagine these two possible scenarios when you're looking at a sideways consolidation, and then you just sort of watch how the market acts, you'll get a feeling for which version it is. If it's one of these versions or the other skewed heavily, you'll see that there are strong hands on one side. You'll see that there are weak hands on, on the other side. And if you, start to, uh, if you start to think in these terms as you're watching patterns form, it's just a good intellectual exercise to start to give you a, a, a little bit better skill at reading patterns and how they're likely to work out when there's going to be these sudden bars that people people all of a sudden think there must be some kind of headline. But there's no headline. There's no headline necessary with this market the way that it is. It's just because the market is endogenously structured. If it's that market, if it's this market, it's endogenously structured to make this move. It's going to happen. It just takes a nudge. Eventually, there's no way around it. It doesn't need a headline. It doesn't need a catalyst. And this can happen on multiple time frames. You can imagine a one-minute chart. You can imagine a daily chart. It doesn't matter. OK, so the point is, if you're a short-term trader, your success pretty much hinges on avoiding being in positions that are crowded with weak hands. So when you think, oh, there's probably a bunch of traders who are betting on this in particular, and there's probably not much else, don't join that side of the market. It may work, but let's say you've got like an oversold stock, like MasterCard today. We saw that stock just get ripped to shreds. Right? It hit 230, bounced a bit, and then just went ripping right down through that level. I don't even know where it ended up. 225 blasted down to 220. But you know, it got to a point where there was just a bunch of traders looking for a bounce because it had gone down so far. When it came back through that level again, well, you saw that there were no strong hands under that 230 level. It was all weak hands. When it hit that point, it was just that feedback loop right on down the line, right down to 220. It didn't take a new catalyst at that point. And it's just it had gotten so oversold. One of the consequences of that in this case, since there were no strong hands buying it, was that it was just being held up by weak hands at 230. So, don't get into the positions that are crowded with weak hands if you can avoid it. And obviously, it's not that easy. It's easier said than done. But um, <clears throat> by the same token, it's good to be on the other side of situations just like that. That's why it's really good to play with the trend, generally speaking. And, and this is a good example of something where the logic applies to any market. It's not just stocks. It's what I say when, when I say you can trade other markets, when there's a lot of action going on. If you get good at reading in these terms and this sort of concept, then you can trade crude oil, you can trade the yen, you can trade whatever you want, as long as this is what you're focused on and you're good at focusing on this. OK? Um, to make these sorts of decisions, I rely on the process of making inferences. I think that inferences, generally speaking, are better than 
hard data in most cases because nobody else has access to your inferences. Everybody else, ha everybody has access to data about things. But sentiment data is a data point that I lean on. And um, we'll go over some of both of those ideas. Okay, sentiment data in general. Um, I use, I lean on surveys. This is the American Association of Individual Investors. I'm, that one has been absolutely tremendously useful over the last couple of years. Uh, and I think you know, it's been pretty useful for a while. But, but especially the last couple of years, this has really been a giveaway in a lot of cases. You saw me get very bullish in early September and late August. And this is one of the main reasons why everybody in the world was basically persistently bearish all summer. And, uh, and we got into a situation where I felt like all traders were basically leaning short and all money managers were completely underexposed to the market. So if, God forbid, anything seems to improve at all, you get the big rally, and that's exactly what we got. This was this was a big key there, um, and it's a big key for lots of individual setups intraday. And I'll show you exactly some of those setups in just a minute. I also use what's called the robo ratio. This is retail only buy to open options ratio. This means you you talk about retail traders and whether they're buying calls or puts, and that's not closing out positions. That's opening positions. You can see the ratio. So when we get to a speculative frenzy, this is just all calls. This is the large traders only buy to open put call ratio, and um, I'll show you that right now because it's awfully interesting right now. This is what that looks like right now. This down here, the puts, this is inverted. So you can see there's almost no put ownership at all by large traders, and that's why I said the other day when I, when I took that short after the Fed, I said this is an extremely unhedged market. And that means if you start to roll, if you've got some kind of energy going on the downside, there's going to be some follow through to those patterns. You're going to have some tails just jump out of there. You've got a bunch of weak hands that are on the long side. We know this by the fact that everybody's buying calls, large traders and small traders. Everybody's packed full with calls right now. And nobody owns any puts. And if this market starts to go, people are going to have to adjust their positions. It's that position adjustment that gives you those sudden out of the blue big bars. And again, everybody's looking for a headline, but there's no headline to be found. That big bar came just because people were caught in a situation where they weren't prepared for the market starting to move against them. And that's why sentiment data is so useful. It's that endogenous characteristic. When you see a situation where the market is more or less, its internal guts are not organized for a squeeze. They're organized for a downward puke. Even if the upward trend just keeps on rolling along here, there's going to be a lot of moments where good positions are passed from somebody to somebody else because they're just not positioned to take the type of bar that comes at them all of a sudden out of the blue. So sentiment data. Um, and this last line just kind of says the basic sort of uh, uh, plain vanilla kind of statement of how to use sentiment data. If everybody's bearish and the market is going up or at least not going down, you want to be a buyer. That's what it means. It means people aren't long. That's the assumption you have to make. You have to have faith in that sort of thing. When, this, when the data says that everybody is really bearish, you just have to have faith in the idea that what that means is is not a lot of weak-handed long interest in the market. And there's very likely quite a bit of weak-handed short interest in the market. And when, the open, when you come into the open and you, you realize that's how you feel about the market, that's, that's what the data is telling you, that has a big bearing on how you interpret what patterns you see off the open. OK, so but this is difficult to get this sort of data about markets other than stocks. So with markets other than stocks, you have to make some inferences. There are some data that you can get. I use a site called Sentiment Trader for most of this data. I think it's a very good site. That's one T in the middle, Sentiment Trader. OK. Um, Let's look at a couple of examples here. Uh, this is a pattern that I call, I don't really have a name for it. Anyways, to set the scene, the idea is everybody's coming in bearish, the market gaps up, and it starts to run a little bit during the morning to the upside after making us uh, after being really weak over, over preceding days and with sentiment showing that everybody's bearish. And the way that it plays out, you see the daily chart down here. You can see we're coming off the highs. We've got this gigantic puke bar. This is a daily bar. And we've got the market grinding slowly up into this day here. OK, so it opens on a gap up right here. And you get that trend during the morning. And what's very important, when you see all of these characteristics in place, when you see a lateral trend in the, during the lunchtime period, when people are bearish, you've got a trend day going to the upside. And you get a very tight lateral consolidation during lunchtime after a gap and run open. When all of those characteristics are the case, 
the inference side of what I'm talking about here, the inference that you need to be making is that a lot of traders, particularly less experienced traders, are going to have been sitting there all day trying to short this thing. And what happens when you're a trader and you're trying to do something, you think you know what's going to happen, and it keeps on working against you. You try to short here, it doesn't work. You try to short here, get blown out on this one. Here it's finally rolling over, boom. You tend to get locked into this pattern, especially if you're less experienced, where you say to yourself, if it turns and starts to roll over now and I'm not short, I'm going to feel even worse than all the money that I've lost today. So the decisions start to become less and less rational at that point for a lot of weak-handed money that's going to be in the market. And you can see all the stops get hit here. For all the traders who are thinking that way, they finally see this, they short it, the stops get hit here. They finally see this, they short it, the stops get hit here. And now look at these two bars. And this is what I think is really important. This is why this is a setup to me. I've made all of those inferences, and I've got this idea about what's going on. And I see these two bars, the sharpest two down bars all day, basically, except for these early on in the morning. But this is after a barely higher high, or let's say what we might call a failed breakout. That's going to stick out like a red flag here. Let me slide it over. Maybe you can see it kind of like that, as if it was hard right edge. That sticks out. If you've been waiting to short something all day, and you finally see that, you're going to pretty much be probably sucked into your largest short position of the day, unless you've just kind of thrown in the towel, or you're a better trader. So this happens to you. This to me, I just buy this openly right there. I mean, I don't even worry about waiting for it to go up. I'll just buy it there. I know that I've got a big buyer in the market because it's not traders buying. You know what their sentiment is. And yet somebody's just been in there, or many somebody's have been in there, just powering, sitting on the bid. Anybody who wants to sell to them, they just soak it right up. You can see this midday consolidation. All the sellers coming in, this bid just keeps on marching along and soaking it right up. So I've got them as my sort of support. I've got them as my brace, and I don't need to worry. So I buy, and you know I can just put a stop down here somewhere. And as this starts to leak up, then I see all these guys are on the hook. So the moment we start to move back above this level, I'll add to it because at this point, you know I think you're going to get more of a flush out. And this can be stayed with after the close, especially if you stay if you close on the highs. Maybe you don't want to do that. But either way, that's the setup. If you see bad sentiment, you see that gap up against the sentiment. So this is the counter sentiment trend day counter sentiment gap, and you see that lateral consolidation in the middle, you've just got to make the inference that you know a bunch of people are thinking it has to go the other way, because you know that's how they're feeling about the world. The world is such a negative place, it has to go down. And so you want to, you want to think not about what the econ data was in the morning. You want to think about what impact maybe that that's had on people, and, and, and look at how the market's just not acting like that, and go with how the market's acting, and try to take advantage of how other people are going to be making poor decisions relative to that action. Okay, so. Next one, the width sentiment trend reversal. So this is in a situation like we had yesterday. We had a nice one of these. I missed it, and, and it was frustrating. We had another one of these. We had one of these yesterday. We've got that. I showed you that Lobo ratio. And um, let's see. Here is the AAII data right now. You see basically this is, a, this is a, right about a four-year high in bullishness coming into yesterday. And we've got a lot of calls being owned. We've got very few puts being owned. This is the up-to-date data from yesterday. So, you know, my, my read is the sentiment's extremely bullish, and um, I don't have an actual chart of this one. Although, yeah, sure, I can do that. Uh, let's see. Let's look at the NQs from yesterday real quickly. Oops. Okay, here's the, the NQs from yesterday. And we have that sentiment data, and we've got this move through the previous day's highs. And this does not give you the same kind of lateral range. Instead, it turns, and you get a big bar to the downside. Now you, you're you thinking the exact opposite of the last example with the counter sentiment trend. This is with sentiment trend. In other words, the market is moving with the prevailing sentiment. People are bullish, and the market's moving up. That means you're going to have a lot of weak hands that keep on feeling like, oh, they're going to miss the next big move, because all they've seen for the last two months is that we get into these situations and the market explodes higher. So they're going to feel almost forced into those positions. And when that's the type of money that's in those positions, when the market starts to go the other way, you get some of these patterns that just clean them out. And this bar in particular in the afternoon, really, people just piling in. They see this, oh, it's a down bar. That means I have to buy it. They see this, oh, it's another down bar. That means I have to buy it. If that's where traders are, boy, look at these two big up bars. Well, I've got to buy it. And look at this seller sitting right here. Somebody's just sitting on top of this market with all the traders buying right into them, and there they all go right out the other side. So even though we're well back above that right now, 
this is just what you get when you get a bunch of weak hands piling into the market, and you get that situation when the trend, when the sentiment is extremely bullish, and the trend moves up for the first half of the day and then falters. So there's a second example of how I kind of look at these sorts of things. Um, and again, I missed that yesterday, and that's kind of too bad. All right, this thing I call the flash bar. Um, this is again about making inferences about what people might be thinking or feeling and I trust my own read for making those inferences and, and, and hopefully you kind of learn to do the same thing. Uh, this is uh, crude oil a couple of days ago. The situation here, you don't need sentiment data at all for this, but you know that if you see a particular one bar move, like one minute or two minutes, where a market moves very strongly, it's been trickling sideways, and then there's just this big jump all of a sudden. In this case, crude oil jumped like, like 20 ticks or something in one minute. And, um, and what you, the inference that you need to make is that everybody sees that. And so if everybody who's been sitting there looking to buy crude oil sees that, they're probably going to feel like they better buy it now or they're going to miss it, or at least they've got to put something on. So the point isn't to fade that necessarily. The point is just to make the inference when you see something like this right here to just watch it, to make a note of it. You see this? Everybody's seen it. This just sticks out like a sore thumb given what had been going on for about the last hour. If you see no progress being made for a while, and then you see it start to slip the other way, you know there's probably a bunch of money in this market right now that's not strong-handed, that's not going to buy more if it goes down. This pops for whatever reason, who knows why. But just use that information to know that there's probably some vulnerable positions sitting there. Perhaps this comes roaring back right after it, it knocks them out of the market. But if it does start to roll, you know there's going to be pockets where people are going to be taking the other side of their original order flow. They're going to be pushing, they're just going to be jumping out because it's obviously not working. So you can, when you see this, look for a seller. If you see a seller, you see it start to falter, maybe put a little bit on short, especially if crude <coughs> in this situation is relatively weak on what I call the correlated risk asset spectrum. So if you see crude doing this and it's been relatively weak during the day while copper's been ripping, the euro's been ripping, gold and silver have been ripping, you know, maybe, maybe think about just putting on this crude short somewhere in this area and just waiting for people to fall out. Okay, so there's the flash bar idea, and, and it's very important that it's a very fast, sharp, sudden move. The impact that that has on people's minds, on people who have been sitting there watching the market, and they see that, it forces them into certain actions. So the point, judge this pattern by the degree to which you feel like, oh, that's really going to stand out to people. If it's a slow, grinding move up, it doesn't have the same effect. So that's why I call it the flash bar. Okay. The escalator is another set of inferences about what weak hands versus strong hands are going to be doing. The escalator is the idea that when markets move slowly in a grinding fashion, seemingly making reversals over and over again, but none of those reversals ever stick. And I'll show you a good example of that style of movement here. <coughs> this is what I mean by it's kind of grinding down, making tons of barely lower lows that just keep getting popped right back up, but it just keeps on gradually going down. The reason why I call it the escalator is because, to me, that sort of thing looks like somebody who's walking up on a down escalator. And the escalator's moving just slightly faster than they're walking up. So they're moving down, but their feet look like they're walking up. If you watch somebody walking like that on an escalator, just imagine that. This is when they turn around. So. And the point here is, Basically, as all those little faux reversals keep forming, and you haven't had any capitulatory bar, you're probably getting a lot of weak hands that are actually, it's sort of like the pattern like that accumulates weak hands as it's moving down in an orderly way. We actually saw this on the flash crash day. Uh, they would be at an escalator all the way down until all of a sudden this vicious turn, if you remember the 3rd of, of May. It was just very orderly. We were down so far. The point is, if it goes a long ways in a very orderly fashion with these barely lower lows constantly being propped back up, it's just going to keep sucking people in. And then eventually, it's going to just puke them all out. This is when he turns around on the escalator and you just see the people who are selling here, the important thing is to understand there's a force in the market. There's somebody selling. You can infer this. There's a big seller or a few big sellers who just keep trailing down on the offer. In the case of the flash crash, we had some fund that was dumping 75,000 e-mini contracts over the course of like 30 minutes. Somebody like that could be in the market. 
and it's just going to eventually overwhelm the traders. So they're still selling. This big force is still selling here. It's just now all the traders are selling too. That's why the acceleration. Nothing happened. No headline crossed at this point. It's just all the traders who've been getting picked up at this point, we finally hit their pain point and turned, and they just all start to sell together. The big seller is sitting on the offer, and the small traders who've been trying to buy all the way down, just picking it up from this big seller. It happens here. It happens again here. So you make those sorts of inferences. You see a pattern like this underway, and you know that in, when you see this make enough iterations, once it's gotten to about this level, you just have to trust and have faith in the idea that you're going to see something like this. There's no way this thing is actually just going to turn around without shaking some of these guys out. It has become the opposite of that theoretical market we looked at earlier, where there's just a bunch of weak hands. At this point, this long interest is just all those Ws. And the short interest, who knows what the short interest is? It almost doesn't matter. Because there's, there's somebody on the offer that's more than strong-handed. Every uptick is being sold right back down. And this is gradually becoming weaker and weaker and weaker until it collapses. You just have to have faith in that and be willing to pyramid a little bit and just know that this bar is coming and not get shaken out on all these little pops to the upside. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, um, one other sentiment data slash inference that I make that basically applies across markets. Um, as a general rule, I do use news. I do use headlines, and the way that I use them is I'm familiar with what's important for different markets. I'm totally familiar with it, and I know what should matter, and I know what the intuitive reaction should be. So when I see a piece of data that comes out that I know should be really good for a market, and that market can't rally on it, I look at that market and say, that's a weak market. If I see bad news for that market come out, I don't think the market should go down. I just watch the market and realize that what it does relative to that bad news will tell me whether it's a weak or strong market. If that bad news comes out, that market holds up, tries to jam down. I see some volume come in. I see the traders coming in and shorting it, but the market holds on the bad news and then gradually starts to grind and reverse and go back up. I know the squeeze is coming. I buy the market. So I do use news, but I do I, I, I use it basically as a way to help me figure out what the endogenous state of that market is. Is it strong? Is it weak at that price? I would say of everything that I, that I know to do, something where there's a market with very bearish sentiment that gets hit with very, very bad news and can't go down, to trade that market on the long side is probably the single easiest setup that I know of. Um, but here's a crude oil example from a couple weeks ago. This is a five-minute chart. So these bars are actually crude oil. The data, the inventory data came out right about here. And this went sideways for about 15 minutes trying to jam down. And then it took about 15 more minutes to move back up to this 82 level. And this was on terribly bearish inventory data at this point. I mean, overwhelming build. And it went across from crude to, to gasoline to distillates. It was, just, it was just awful data. And this market rallied on it. And it had been holding up through, through all of this. And this is after going down about 10% over a few days. Oh, I think there's just a big buyer in this. So I turn around and I start buying crude oil. By the end of the day, crude's up almost 4%. And the, the, the setup, the idea, was just simply that I know it should go down on that data, and it simply can't. So the inference is there's probably a lot of weak-handed shorts, people who are playing the data, people who want to make money on the basis that there's bad data. That's not going to be your strong hand type of market force. That's a weak hand. That's a trader. Somebody who says, bad data, market has to go down, and they trade on the basis of the headlines rather than trading on the basis of what the market is doing, and they get caught, and they get squeezed. And, and you can play the other side of that. So if you think in terms of the counter news idea. OK, um, so this is a primer. This is what I mean. And this is a very central concept to me. Um, and now we can take a look at what I actually look at when I trade. And then we can go to some questions. Uh, hold on one moment. OK, first of all, here's what I trade. You can watch that for just a second while I set this up. Across the currency spectrum, the euro, the yen, the Aussie dollar, the Canadian dollar, the Swiss franc, and the British pound, pretty much the currencies that I trade. Commodities, I pretty much stick to crude, net gas, gold, silver, copper. And then I trade the, uh, the minis, all three of them. I don't trade the Russell. I don't know why. I just don't. Um, OK. Screen. OK, now you should be able to see all my screens. 
All right, and we can uh, get rid of this for now. So here's what I look at during the day. Um, basically, over here, I've got different markets. This is eSignal, by the way. So I've got the S&P, the NAS 100. And I actually had to change the configuration here, so things are going to be a little misaligned because I changed the resolution so that this we're recording this, and uh, for some reason the thing that records it can't deal with the resolution that I had. So this is a lower resolution than I normally use. Um, so there's a, the S&P and the NAS. That's pretty much how I watch stocks. Sometimes I have the financial sector up here. I used to have the financials and the energies up here, but now I've shifted. I'm watching crude, gold, copper, the euro, the yen, and the ten-year. And I'm basically watching all of these markets at the same time all day. And what I'm looking for is how they're correlating together. Because generally speaking, all of these, excluding the treasuries most of the time, all of these go through periods where they're all running together. And they're all running against the dollar. And the basic idea there is I think where, we're, where interest rates are right now, every, this market is trading 100% on leverage to the leverage on or leverage off. And, um, and when you open that leverage, you know, you're basically selling dollars. That's essentially you know, the idea of a, a carry trade or whatever you want to call it, but you know, you, the margin is dollar debt. So you're, you're, you're taking debt in dollars is basically being short dollars. So people are either opening those positions up or closing them down, and it tends to flow into everything. Um, but of course, sometimes we have something particular going on in Europe, or sometimes we have something going on in Japan, et cetera, so sometimes these can get off. Um, but I'm looking for relative strength and weakness. And today, good example, I wanted to short gold, and this is going to really piss me off later because I'm going to see gold tanking through these lows. And, and it's just, I, I, I had a lot of size on it in the gold short that you saw on the site. And, um, and I really felt like we were going to see one of those bars where it just collapses. And you see this just puking, retching kind of bar. And we didn't get it. And silver, I think, is to blame for that. There was a big buyer in silver who just, just stuck there no matter what. And people came in and tried to short silver, I think, as the laggard. And into the close, those shorts just got closed out and to give up, and I think that that basically helps gold hold up. We'll see. I may be trading it tonight, uh, but either way, um, <clears throat> so there's my setup, and, um, and you can see over here, I've got basically tickers that I can scroll through, and I can see an intraday chart. Let's, see, let's put the euro up there. Let's see, I can see the intraday chart. Maybe I want to look at a three-minute, a five-minute, et cetera. Usually I have this actually organized like this. So I have what I call the scrunched intraday chart. It's a bar chart. I scrunch them all over. I put it on 30 minutes or 60 minutes. And it basically gives me a sort of detail window into what's going on in the recent pattern in, in, on the daily chart. And then here's the weekly chart. And again, I like, I like uh, support and resistance are important to me, especially when I, I see them in action themselves. I see that it's support rather than I just look and say, there was a low there or there is a moving average there, therefore it's support. I don't really deal with support that way. What I do is I watch it trade the level, and if I see that the level is being used, especially in a currency market, it could be, it could be a, a sovereign wealth fund or something that's there, and that's just going to be that for the level. That's going to be the level no matter what at that point. It doesn't matter what people want to do. If somebody's sitting there with that kind of size, then that's that. So I wait to see if that sort of thing is going on. And you can see nice. Here's I identify support in the euro pretty easily right here along 1.32. This is, this is a big bar. So that's kind of how I go about it. And um, we can now shift to question and answer if you want to. Um, and you can just start typing them in. And I'll take you off mute now. But if you, you try to go like one at a time, and I don't know, it'll work out. And I'll probably read the question out or, or answer the question. I'll push you back on mute while I'm doing that. So if you ask something while I'm, while I'm talking, then you know that, that it's not coming through. But if anybody has any questions, feel free. Unmuted. And now you're unmuted. Well, now you're unmuted. Panel on the right. OK, hold on. Slow down. How did I set up the panel on the right? Do you mean this uh, quote board? It's a quote board. If you use e-signal, it's a function called quote board. Whatever you type in, you can use uh, these links. I can link it to whatever I want. So I've linked it to these charts. So whatever I click on here loads the intraday, the scrunch chart, the daily, the weekly. And I can just basically sit here during the day and just kind of scroll through with the arrows and just watch everything. So uh, this is eSignal. That's the system I use. I also use Ensign Windows as more of a research 
because I've learned how to program in the, in the programming language that actually underlies that whole program. So when I want to do any kind of testing or research or anything like that, um, I learned that, at, and like I said, I started out eight or ten years ago trying to, to write systems to beat the futures markets, and, and that's when I started using that program and, and worked out. Um, and, and for trading, I, I, I use IB, Interactive Brokers. I've never had a problem with it. I've used it for 10 years. I get excellent executions, and I, I, I very fast, low commission, so I definitely, I don't see any, yes, futures. I know a lot of, a lot of uh, trader friends of mine have switched over to, to something else, some, where there, there are systems that are giving just wacky deals right now in futures prices, and, and I've just learned how to use IB well enough that I guess it's just, it's enough to keep me there now. Perhaps that'll change if somebody comes out with a good enough deal. I would say the one, three, five, I kind of scroll back and forth through them constantly. So here, let me zoom back in over. Oh, sorry, I'm supposed to be reading these questions off. What charts are most important to me? The one minute, the two minute, five minute, the 30 minute are all. Um, I, as I'm saying, here, let me switch this uh, right back over here. So I tend to scroll very quickly back and forth through, and, and I'm just kind of watching for somebody to catch my eye. Um, um, but, you know, I, I really, I definitely do watch the one minute and try to make sure I keep it in perspective on what's on the wider time frame where I am. But I watch the one minute, I guess, almost kind of like somebody uses the time in sales. I consider myself at this point, I just, for whatever reason, I've just gotten to the point where I can basically read the one minute chart as, as order flow. I can see when I see these spikes of volume come in and I see the price not be able to move or I can see a pop through a level. I know when somebody's positioned somewhere, or at least I think I do, well enough for me to make money. So I kind of scroll back and forth constantly through these. Um, yeah, so I talked about what, what the question is, what, what do you think about oscillators for intraday like, like RSI um, or stochastics? Um, I, I, as I said, I started out writing programs. I, I included a lot of technical indicators in those programs, and I basically got to the point where what I realized, and, and anybody can realize it's a very simple fact, RSI actually includes no more information than the bars on the chart. It just reconfigures, so you can be watching the bars and the volume. RSI doesn't even include the volume. It's just simply price and time. It just reconfigures what the price and time look like. And if you like looking at it that way, then that's fine. But it's not, it's not going to include more information than the bars on the chart. And I just kind of, I realized that while I was writing programs, and I realized I didn't need to even use the RSI. I could just put in a simple line to define the RSI to it, and it would just find RSI in the bars. But I just don't think that the hard right edge aspect of it really works for me. If you sit there and watch these things all day, you can develop a very nuanced feel for something like MACD or RSI or stochastics. But that's really in you. You're becoming good at reading it. It's not giving you the answer. It, none of those things contain the answer. Trust me. Um, OK, uh, uh, where am I now? Overall, where do you think the market is headed? Overall, I think it's an uptrend, and I'm not going to fight that, except I do realize it's late stage. I realize it's late stage because of that options information that I showed you. Um, but you, know, you see this every day. If you guys see my ETF daily notes, hopefully you read that, because it's not really about ETFs at this point. It just sort of has that name. It's like a legacy effect. It's just my thoughts on all the markets every morning when I come in. So that's the ETF daily notes. I just, I just post there what my gut feeling is. Um, and, and you'll know when I have a strong feeling because I write a lot more and I'm very clear and I say this is what's going to happen. And, and right now I don't have that strong of a feeling. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not really wanting to fight the market, but I do see that there's that opportunity for those with sentiment counter trend moves at times when we get an explosion to the upside. But there's also a lot of money that can still come plowing into things. So, um, so that's not the greatest answer in the world, but there you go. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, it, you maybe sell calls if that's what your strategy is. The question is, what are your thoughts about playing options, selling options? I've gotten into options a little bit, and I just never really, um, I never really got that comfortable with it. I just, I just rather play the market underneath. I guess I, I feel like if you specialized in it and you spent years of doing that, I've spent years doing this, and, and I've developed a feel for what I'm doing, and there are different dimensions that are brought into the game with options. And I feel like, you know, if I had spent, if I spent the next five years trading options, eventually I get to the point with options that I am now just with the underlying market. And it's unlikely for me to spend that kind of time on it. 
So I, I can't really answer that very well. What's the breakdown between trades you enter and exit during the day versus keeping overnight? It's like 99% that I enter and exit during the day. 1% keep overnight. And, and that may change depending on the markets, but when I'm trading a lot in currency and commodities like I am now, and the volatility is really good intraday, I just don't need to worry about it. I, 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 I like to have a lot of leverage on when I'm doing it. If I got that gold breakdown today, that would, really would have paid off very big for me. I would have had to have much smaller size on if I was thinking about where gold's going to be two days from now. There's a good chance that would have been a better decision. If I got the short off around 1370 in gold, and I was willing to give it 10 handles and just kind of come back to it in three days, you know, I might be able to take that trade off at, at 1310 for a huge profit. But I would have made that same profit or more by having you know, five to ten times the contract size on if we got that breakdown today. So I kind of think in those terms. I'm kind of an ADD guy, I guess. So you, you have to develop a trading style that, that, kind of, that kind of meshes with your personality. And for me, I don't, you know, I, I'm never going to be somebody who has a tremendous amount of patience. So, so I, really don't, I really don't hold much overnight. Uh, do I ever use NYSE advanced? Oh, occasionally and on long time frames, I kind of look at it, but I think that uh, uh, I think that it, breadth readings have actually gotten very skewed over the last few years. So I don't I don't think you can use the same ideas that, that people use with breadth from maybe a decade ago. And I think largely that's the the high frequency guys and the ETFs affecting things, and also probably the macro environment right now that people are trading stocks so together. But we've have we have just a record number over the last few years of days where 90% of stocks are up or 90% of stocks are down. So, um, so I, I don't really, I don't really pay that much attention to breadth. I guess I, I, I do pay attention to volume on the exchanges, and I pay attention to looking at different markets, and occasionally the VIX in a sort of counter way. If I, if the VIX goes way up all of a sudden, you know, I'm thinking that it may be a good time to buy the market. I don't really look at that as a sign that the market's going to turn and start going down. I think people are overreacting, usually when the VIX spikes very sharply. So. Um, Let's see. At what point do you go for the kill, i.e., when the euro went to 1.43? Um, let's see. Hopefully I understand what you're saying there. Um, so let's just see. Oh, you mean for that uh, fading the Fed, essentially. Yeah, I missed that one. That was just hell. I had to catch it and, and try to trade the trend afterwards, but um, I don't fade for the kill. I'll tell you that right now. I go for the kill in a market that's doing all the things that I would think that it would be doing if I was right about what I thought it was going to do. And that's a ridiculous sounding sentence. But what, what I'm really trying to say is if I think in a situation like this, so let's say, let's take us back there. you got that Fed fade, that idea basically. Right here, Fed comes out, QE2. Um, you get the market pops up on the QE2, doesn't roll over immediately. It actually takes another day. It really just smack everybody who tried to fade on that. Um, but if uh, my larger view is this is going to turn and, and, and come down and we're going to have an actual trend in the opposite direction, I may have a little bit on as this starts to roll. But where I go for the kill is if I see day by day by day, it starts to act like it makes me feel like, wow, it went too far too fast. And I think that probably a lot of other traders are thinking, oh, now it's a good buy because look at, they're doing QE2 and the euro is pulled back this far, I've got to buy it. When it gets to that point and it still kind of just plods along and grinds lower, then I start to think of going for the kill. So somewhere, if I traded it perfectly, this would be roughly where the perfect going for the kill would be. It starts to bounce after making that move and then just comes right back down. And I think there's probably a lot of people on the hook who are going to get flushed out of it if it drops back below this level and you get that, and you get the trend that follows, that kind of situation where it's gone too far, and then it pushes yet further. That, that I like to go for the kill in that respect rather than going for the kill fading. So I don't go for the kill going, wow, it's gone all the way to 1.43. I'm going to fade the hell out of this. Some people like to trade that way. It just doesn't make me feel comfortable when it's not actually doing what it is that I want to see it doing. So next question, when you enter a trade and then say you're taking a partial, let me turn the audio back on. Hopefully you guys haven't been asking questions verbally. You're unmuted now. Um, where did the chat go? All right. Um, <clears throat> when you enter a trade and say that you're taking the partial, what percent do you normally take off the trade? I try to take it off in quarters. So if I did like, like, I don't know, um, um, 12 or 16 contracts in gold, then I'd be taking off three or four initially. Um, 
And and I do do more. There's more activity that I do that I, I, I don't get posted to you guys because it's sort of in the flow of, of what I'm doing. But um, you get most of it. And sometimes I do add or take some off and move move around that way. But but I, I, I try to do it in quarters as far as scaling out. But I like to do it with limits and I like to do it on pukes. If I see a, a market that I think is going down that's full of weekends on the long side, I don't like to take it off unless I see a stabbing puking move. I usually cover when I see that happen. If it's grinding down, I won't take anything off. <coughs> that's what I've tried to do. Ideally, let's just say that. Um, okay. Anybody have anything else? Feel free. No, I have no insight. You have, you have to wait for Scalp to give me his insight on preferred. He's the man there. Hey, Breck, can you hear me? Yeah, I sure can. Okay, very Go good. Ahead. Thank you for your great work. This is Bill out in Seattle. Um, okay, Bill. Kind of a weird weird question. You know, it's gotten harder sure. and harder Far to away. trade um, relative to the discernment of the tape. You know, you, a lot of it I do is by feel an interpretation, mm -hmm. whether it was from sure. being pennied, you can't measure institutional <coughs> order flow anymore, um, all that. And now you've you got... About, you know, what the, sort of market are you talking about? What sort of market do you trade? Oh, well, individual equities. Okay, see, that's, that's exactly the point that I was making earlier. I don't know if you were... Were you, were you on the whole way? Earlier yeah, I talked yeah. about specifically the reason why I've moved out is because I used to trade individual equities quite a bit. And right now, trading something like Netflix for me, just, it's just not fun. I mean, to, to make that read, I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of you're, you're dealing with computers now rather than crowds of people. And you may be dealing with just one individual institution that's completely able to dominate what that stock's doing. And you can't do that to the entire S&P, or you can't do that to the euro. These, these markets are too big. It's one of the main reasons why I've moved out and I pretty much exclusively trade at the market level. The title of this presentation is the idea of, a, I think it's called avoiding something or other. Yeah. Moving beyond the noise of individual stocks to focus on opportunity. That's kind of exactly what I'm getting at there, moving beyond that noise. For me, it's just become a hassle to trade individual stocks. And if you, you can't get futures in those stocks, so it, to trade stocks that are too big for somebody to mess with, you, you you can't really uh, you can't really find enough leverage to, to make anything. No, if, you, if you trade the futures in the S and P or the futures in the euro or, or whatever else, then you can you get away from you get away from that that kind of what what Damon calls price mirages, and and you still have the leverage to make some money. So that makes perfect sense. One one other question relative to that: Do you ever try and handicap or anticipate? Uh, certain arbitrage or carry trades or what futures affect other things. Like, in other words, you, you, in this day and age, it seems like things trend and trend and trend beyond belief. And you talked about reversion to means. Um, guilty yeah. as charged is trying to anticipate a reversion to a mean kind of trade. So do you ever anticipate where there's something that's a, that just seems obvious that there's a couple of futures or whatever I, that are affecting each other, and then you, you try and jump in putter and handicap that? Well, I use the intermarket. So, so basically, if I see two things that are trending together like that, um, and let's say I'm looking at, uh, let's, say, let's say gold and the euro are moving together against the dollar, and um, they're both, let's say they're both getting ripped up. And, and I want to pick, you know, so let's say I want to buy, I think, both of them may be in a zone where we could see some buyers come in and have a meaningful bounce. I, first of all, I try to stay away from thinking in those terms. I try to think instead, has everybody who's going to puke puked? And if I don't, if the answer to that to me is not yes, then I try to look for joining that trend. But if I, I think there's been some real just gut-wrenching kind of puking going on, then I'll look at relative strength and weakness. If I see that gold is suddenly holding up and the euro keeps going down, I won't look to buy the euro. I'll look to buy gold. That because the, eventually the euro is going to snap back a little bit, and and I think a lot of traders will play the laggard theme. That's one thing I'm cautioning you guys to do if you're trading these different markets. Don't play the laggard theme. Don't say euro is going a lot. They've been correlated together. Gold should therefore go down. I'm going to short gold. It just doesn't seem to work out very well. Gold's showing you there's a buyer there. When the euro bounces, gold's going to squeeze. So I would buy gold in that situation. So I do that sort of thing all the time. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Anybody have anything else? 
Is it time for a drink? Looks like we're good? Okay. All right, well, um, thank you guys very much. And uh, if you would, it would be great if you gave me some feedback on this, what you liked about it, et cetera. You can just, you can just send it to, uh, you can send it to our, anybody here, you send it to the feedback button that's actually on the site, the talk to us button, or you can send it to, I'm going to type my email address in the chat thing here. So feel free, feel free to send me anything any, anytime you want, okay? Thanks, Bill. All right. You guys have a great night, and maybe we'll do another one of these before too long. Okay? Take care.